Ghost of the Devil's Bake Oven. Legends of death haunt the rivers of Illinois, telling tales of bloodshed, piracy, and murder. Violence often occurred along the Mississippi River, and during the ha first half of the 1800s, pirates and Native Americans attacked boats and travelers that passed along the, the river. Perhaps the most dangerous place along the Mississippi was near the present-day Grand Tower, where a menacing collection of outcroppings marked a place of death for river travelers. The Native Americans were convinced the evil spirits lurked there, waiting to claim the lives of unwitting victims. The white men who settled the area would later acknowledge these beliefs by giving the towers by giving the towers by giving the towering rocks suitable names. There is one landmark called the Devil's Backbone, which is a rocky ridge about one half mile long. A steep gap of the north edge of the backbone separates it from the Devil's Bake Oven, a larger rock that stands on the edge of the river and rises to heights of nearly 100 feet. The river ran with blood in 1786 when a band of immigrants ascending the river from the Ohio, ascending the Mississippi River from the Ohio, was attacked by Indians at the south edge of the of, of the Devil's Backbone. The settlers were scalped, mutilated, and killed, all except for one. The lone survivor was a young man named John Casper Mordock. He was able to hide in the rock until the killers had departed. He buried his family and then made his way upstream to Kaskaskia. He related his horrible story there and managed to assemble a group of men who helped him wreak vengeance on the Indians who took his family's lives. Mordock's party traveled south to the ambush site, but was unsuccessful in finding the two guilty parties. And finding the guilty parties, however, Mordock was unwilling to give up. Two years after the massacre, he attacked and killed a group of Indians near the massacre site. Whether or not these particular Indians were involved in the bloody ambush is unknown, but by this time, Mordock didn't care. As as far as he was concerned, all Indians were guilty, and he began a relentless campaign to kill as many as he could. He stalked and killed dozens of Indians, many of them unarmed, and later, as heard of a volunteer m militia, he reportedly shot and killed Native Americans who surrendered his to his troops. Word spread about his obsession, and he became known as the Indian Slayer. In the years that followed the Mordock Massacre, river navigation to the came to the Mississippi, and keelboats and flatboats passed the area in great numbers. During this time, the Devil's Bake o Oven served as a landmark for river pilots. It also afforded an excellent lookout point from which boats could be seen coming from miles away. The, the two outcroppings of rocks also made excellent hiding places for river pirates to lie and wait for their victims to come along. In fact, river pirate raids became so bad that in 1803, a, de a detachment of federal cavalry cavalrymen were detached to drive out the outlaws from the area. They set up camp at the Devil's Bake Oven from May to September of that year. While the soldiers waited, the river pirates simply moved their camp to a rock overhang on the muddy on the big muddy river. The place is still known today as Sinner's Harbor. One of, once the military left, the outlaws returned to, to attacking boats on the river. Later, as settlers and a semblance, and a semblance of civilization arrived, the pirates moved on, and the rapids beneath the Devil's Bake Oven became a much safer a much safer place. They also, however, became ho became home to one of the mo of one of the region's most haunting legends. After the after the departure of the pirates, years passed and the Grand Tower began to began to grow. It became a busy river port where goods were shipped and received daily. On the west side of the Devil's Backbone, between the rock formation and the river, it is the site of two vanished iron furnace iron furnaces that operated there until around 1870. Iron ore was brought to these furnaces from Missouri and they were filled with and they were fired with coal from Murfreesboro. It was said that Andrew Carnegie once considered making the Grand Tower along with a box factory and a shipyard. Wait. Once considered making the Grand Tower the Pittsburgh of the West. The population soon expanded and a lime kiln was started in Grand Tower along with a box factory and a shipyard. A number of river barges and, and steamers were constructed here. New business 
came to the area, an even amusement park was opened in, on Walker's Hill, just east of town. Time marched on, and the city seemed poised to become a major population center until a cholera epidemic swept through the area and wiped out most of the residents. Within a short time, the coming of the railroads and decline in river traffic drove away most of the remaining residents. Grand Tower was once Grand Tower was once a town of more than 4,000 souls, but only a fraction of them still remain. It was the expansion of the iron industry in Grand Tower that brought about the great legend that still haunts the town today. The Devil's Bake Oven became the site of Grand Tower's first ironworks when the new industry came. Several attractive homes were built for the were built for the locals of the company, including one for the superintendent. This house was constructed on top of the Devil's Bake Oven. The foundation of the old house can still be seen on the eastern side of the hill today, which is where a lonely ghost reportedly walks, and it has been said that her voice is sometimes heard among the ruins of the old house. A once happy place that became one, one of tragedy and despair. According to the old story, the ghost is that of the superintendent's young daughter. The girl is said to be very beautiful, but also sheltered and naive about life. Her darting father kept her away from the rough men of the foundry, and although she had a number of suitors seeking her hand in marriage, her father accepted none of them. Finally, one day, the girl fell in love with one of the young men who came to court her. Her father did not approve, and therefore forbade his daughter to see the young man. After she slipped away to meet the young man a few times in the night, he confined her to her at the house. The young man eventually left Grand Tower. After he departed, the young girl wept over him for days. In weeks, at last, either, at last, either because of grief or because of some illness brought by her by swear, the young woman died, but she did not leave the devil's bake oven. The spirit of the young girl is said to have lingered, to have lingered at the side of the house for many years after her death. Visitors to the area reported seeing a strange mist-like shape that that resembled the dead near the old house. Her disappearance was often followed by the sounds of moans and wails. It was also believed that when the thunderstorms that when thunderstorms swept across the region, those moans and wails would become blood curdling screams. How long how long the girl haunted the place and whether she still does is not does or not <clears throat> and still does or not is unknown. Some believe that her spirit seeking vengeance for her lost life and love was the cause for the great for the ruin of Grand Tower. It was after her death that the foundries and businessmen and businesses failed. Failed. The epidemic swept through the region and the residents of the once thriving town vanished. Legend has it that not long after the girl's death, her guilt ridden father, unable to cope with what he had done, committed suicide. When the foundry closed down soon after, his once fine home was raised and and its timbers were used to build a railway station. Only its stone foundations remain today. But does the ghost still haunt the Devil's Bake Oven? If she does, she probably finds the area unfamiliar to her now. The town of Grand Tower has faded into a scattering of houses, and there is little to remind us of the history that once enriched a small area, and little to remind us of the young girl who once died here because of a broken heart, and whose spirit refuses to rest in peace.